Welcome to Physics. This is Lisa Knight. This semester you're going to be using um, the James S. Walker Physics text. And this video will give you an overview of Chapter 1. We will study the physics and the nature of laws. We'll do an overview of the units that we'll use in this class. We'll talk about dimensional analysis, significant figures, a quick overview of converting units, and then we'll wrap up the chapter by reviewing everything. Physics is a study of the fundamental laws of nature. These laws can be expressed as mathematical equations, and they can get very complex if we let them. During this course, we will be using and making lots of calculations with measured values. Three basic units of measurement will be units of length, mass, and time. We'll be using the metric system. So first we're going to define our base units. The base unit of length is a meter. At one time, it was defined as one ten millionth of the distance of the north from the North Pole to the equator. Now, it's defined, a meter is defined as the distance traveled by light in a vacuum in one 299 and some billion of a second. Mass will be measured in the kilogram. One kilogram is a mass of a particular platinum iridium cylinder kept at the International Bureau of Weights and Standards in France. And finally, our other base unit will be the second. The second is a time for, is defined as the time for radiation from a cesium-133 atom to complete in a very specific set of oscillations. So each of these base units are defined quantities, have some reference um, value associated with them. As I said, we'll be using the metric system because the metric system is based on powers of 10, so it is very easy to convert from one unit to another unit, just because you can move decimal places or multiply and divide by zeros. Table 1-4 gives you all the common prefixes, and these prefixes can be added to the base units. For example, if the base unit is a gram, you can have a gigagram, a megagram, a kilogram, a centigram, a milligram, a microgram. If the base unit is a meter, you can have a kilometer, a centimeter, a millimeter. You know, so you can combine the prefixes with different base units in the metric system. The ones that you will be responsible for knowing, the symbol and the power that they represent, will be giga, mega, kilo, centi, milli, micro, and nano. So you should expect for there to be questions on the first test about, you know, what power of 10 does kilo, kilo stand for? What power of 10 does micro stand for? What is the symbol for micro? What is the symbol for gig, giga, etc.? So we have our base units, right? Length in meters, time in seconds, mass in kilograms. The rest of the, um, the quantities that we measure are actually calculated quantities. For example, velocity and speed are both calculated finding the distance and dividing it by the time. A unit of length divided by a unit of time. So if your base unit is in meters and your time is in seconds, then velocity would be meters per second. Acceleration generally means to speed up, so you're, it's the rate at which you're increasing your speed. So it would be units of meters per second divided by seconds, which turns into meters per second squared. And weight, which it, we commonly um, know uh, or think of um, as mass, that's an inconsistency, it's incorrect. Weight is actually a force. It is a force of attraction between you and the Earth. And it is calculated using the formula F equals MA, where M is mass and A is acceleration. So 
So when I multiply mass times acceleration, I get kilograms times meters per second, which we call a newton. Now, we do have standard system, U.S. customary system values that are analogous to this. For example, length would be in feet, time would still be in seconds, but mass would be in a, in a unit called the slug. Velocity then would be feet per second. Acceleration would be feet per second per second or feet per second squared. And weight or force is mass times acceleration or slugs times feet per second squared which we call a pound. We will be using the metric system, so any time we have these quantities in a formula, we will be required to make sure that they are in the right unit. So everything should be in meters, seconds, and kilograms in this class. The other thing about units is that the units that we use for quantities can be used, uh, are very important. We can learn a lot from them because these quantities have dimensions, right? You know, distance is a form of length and it's measured in meters. So it's got a length dimension. Area would be, for example, the uh, length times the height of something or the length times length squared. Volume would be length times length times length squared, a cubed. Velocity would be length over time. Acceleration is length over time squared. And uh, something a little more complicated would be energy, which is mass times length squared all over time squared. When we use formulas, formulas should be dimensionally consistent. For example, if we have the formula distance equals velocity times time, distance is going to be measured in some unit of length, maybe a meter. Velocity has the units or dimensions of length over time, and when, when we multiply time by that, we get rid of the time, and we end up with length. So we get length on both sides of the equation. That is said to be dimensionally correct. Our formula should be dimensionally correct. When you are doing problems, you should be plugging in all your units, and you should be able to show that if you're calculating the distance, that you are, in fact, ending up with a unit of distance by canceling out the units. The other thing we're going to do in this class is make measurements. And in any science, you make measurements. So the question is, what is the difference between being accurate and precise? Accuracy is how close a measurement is to the actual value. For example, if you measured you know, something that you know is three centimeters, but you can only, your device can only tell you whether it's, you know, two, keeps telling you it's 2.5. Then it might not be very accurate. In lab, we're going to figure out the accuracy of our lab results by calculating the percent error. Precision is how repeatable a measurement is. It's how many times you get the same value with that instrument. And that is dictated by how how um, uncertain or the tolerance of the instrument that you're using. If we look at this picture here, this bullseye picture, we look at the first, you know, picture, nobody except one person hit the bullseye. So it's very, very inaccurate and it's not very precise because precise is about repeatability. The left hand, excuse me, the right hand side pictures are both very very repeatable, so they're both very precise. But the top right-hand picture is not very accurate because it's not on the bullseye. So it had high precision but low accuracy. And of course, this one right here, the bottom right-hand one, is very, very accurate and has very high precision. When we make measurements, we're usually doing that because we're going to plug those measurements into a calculation and we're going to calculate something. We might be calculating speed, the acceleration, we might be calculating a force. Nonetheless, we're making calculations with measured values, and those measured values each have their own precision, right? They, there's un, determined by the instrument that was used to make them. Some instruments may be more precise than others. It turns out that when we make a calculation, the calculation cannot be any more precise or accurate than the measurements used to make that calculation. So 
So we have to have a quick and dirty way to keep track of our of our act of our precision, and that is by knowing uh, and defining something called a significant figure in a number. And a significant figure is a number of digits in a quantity that are known with certainty. So the number of significant figures is going to determine how how where we're going to round when we start plugging numbers in. So first, let's go over the significant figure rules, and then we'll do a few examples. So first of all, all non-zero numbers, any number but zero, is significant. So if I have the number 1.2, it has two sig figs. Zeros in between those non-zero numbers are significant. So the number 102 has three significant figures. Any zeros that are at the right and at the end, at the right and at the end of the decimal point are significant. So 102.00 has five significant figures and 2.0 has two significant figures. All zeros which are to the left of a written decimal point are in a, a number greater or equal to 10 are always significant. So this means that if you have just um, the number 2000 and there's no decimal there, those zeros are thought to be estimated placeholders. So the rule is if there's a decimal there that you can see, then that means that the measurement went all the way out, it was significant, all the way out to that place. And so all four of the, all three of those zeros are significant. But if there is no decimal, there is not. Mentioning also that if there are zeros in between the non-zero number and the decimal, they're placeholders, just like these are placeholders, so they don't count either. So 0 .0020 only has two sig figs. When we multiply and divide, the rule is that we count the number of significant figures. So when I multiply 4.00 by 2.0, 4 has three sig figs, 2.0 has two sig figs, so my answer has to have two sig figs. When I add and subtract, I'm going to round to the least number of decimal places. So 4.00 minus 2, 2 has no decimal places, so I'm going to just round this number to 2. Here's another example. A tortoise travels at 2.51 centimeters per second for 12.23 seconds. How far does it go? So to get this, I'm going to use some dimensional analysis, right? I want to figure out how far, so I want centimeters. So I'm going to have to multiply these numbers to cancel out the seconds to get centimeters. When I multiply these, right, I'm going to use my rule to count sig figs. This has three sig figs. This has four. I go with the least number, so my answer needs to have three sig figs. The problem is that when we start rounding, right, when we start rounding, um, there can be some error. So we want to make sure that we don't do any rounding until we get to the end of a problem. So make sure, like in this example, we found tax on, on 2.21, we found the tax on 1.35, and we rounded it, and then we added it together, and we got a wrong number. So we want to make sure that we do not um, that we do not do any rounding until the very last step of a problem. The other thing that I'd like to mention is that we are using very large and very small numbers. Um, and we do use scientific notation here. So you might want to review scientific notation, but we can use scientific notation to help us determine if a number has, if zeros are um, significant or not. Because these can be a little dubious. 2,500. Now, there's no decimal here, so we already know the rule. We only have two sig digs. But we might not remember that. So remember that if we actually put this in scientific notation, because there's no decimal here, we can drop these two zeros. And it would be 2.5 times 10 to the 3, and those zeros are gone, so they're not significant, and we only have two sig digs. And 0 .0000036. You know, when I put this in scientific notation, I'm going to get 3.6 times 10 to the negative 5. Those zeros definitely are um, insignificant. They just dropped right out of it. 
Mastering physics is going to be very picky about you following your sig fig rules. So you want to make sure you know them very well. We will be having to convert in this class because remember those base units. Everything needs to be in meters, kilograms, and seconds. So if you're given something in feet, you have to convert it. So let's say you have 316 feet and you want to know you need to convert that to meters to plug it into a problem. Remember, you can look up your conversion tables in your book. They're in the front of your book. One meter is 3.281 feet. So I can write that as 1 to over 3.281 feet or 3.281 feet to 1 meter. What I want to do is I want to multiply 316 feet by the right ratio so that when I multiply, I cancel out the feet. So whatever I have, if I have feet here, I want the ratio with feet in the bottom. So I'm going to multiply this by 1 meter over 3.28 feet. The feet are going to cancel out, so I'm going to divide 316 by 3.281 and get 96.3 meters. Notice that I'm following my safety rules, right? I'm dividing here, I'm multiplying here, excuse me, or dividing. 316 has 3, this has 4, so my answer only needs to have 3. Use your dimensional analysis to help you convert. The other thing I'd like to mention in physics is that we have some, some quantities that are scalar quantities. That means they just are you know, number values. They could be positive or negative, but that doesn't mean anything about anything but that's, that, they're, that we might be losing some temperature or whatever. Temperature, speed, and height, mass, time, all of these are scalars. But we do have some, some quantities that actually have direction associated with them, like a force. If I push somebody with 50 newtons forward, they're going to go forward, right? That force is pushing them forward. If I push them to the south, they're going to go to the south. So displacement, force, Velocity, acceleration are all examples of vectors. And so we'll talk about them in very special, we'll even have a chapter on, them, on how to deal with them. And finally, there's going to be a lot of problem solving here in physics. And it's going to be really important that you read the problem, that you sketch it, and that you identify the appropriate equation that you need to use. And that's what we're going to be concentrating here on in this class, in addition to learning the concepts this semester. I hope that this has, um, you know, given you a good kind of introduction to what we're doing. I'm going to post also some other videos giving you some examples of conversions and problems with significant figures so that you'll see some of that done for you. Please email me if you have any questions.